Thank you, and thanks so much for having us. It's really great to be here to talk about Omar and this project. Um, I thought it might be useful to explain a little bit about how it got started, um, because even in Charleston where we live and work, he's not very well known, uh, or he wasn't very well known. Um, so this, for us, this began in um, 2018, 2019, um, when the Spoleto Festival USA came to our newspaper, which is called the Post and Courier. It's the daily newspaper in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and Spoleto, if you're not familiar, is an international arts festival that comes to the city each year and brings um, very prominent works from all over the world. And so they had commissioned an opera about this man named Omar Ibn Said. And they came to uh, speak with us and with some of our editors about that project. And I have to be honest, I don't think anybody in the room uh, from the newspaper knew who Omar was or had heard of him. And we are all pretty connected in the community. Uh, I've been working in Charleston for about 20 years. And so the fact that we hadn't heard of him uh, and he had this amazing story told us that this was something maybe we should really dig into more deeply. So, uh, so we did. And so Gavin and I began reading about him and realized that there was a lot written about Omar, but it was all from the realm, outside of Omar's writings, it was all from the realm of the white people around him, and that the stories that had uh, been told were uh, sometimes pretty fantastical, or they seemed not rooted in what Omar himself had written. And so we became really interested in this idea of who was Omar really? You know, what could we discover about him that could lend, um, that could build a frame around what, what he what he told us in his own writings. And so that's kind of where we began. Yeah, so after, so we started in fall 2019, and our kind of initial plan for the story was to do two, two parts on Omar, one covering the opera itself and coming together, and then the other, which was the story about Omar and going into his life and trying to find more detail about who he was. And so I think we made our first trip up to North Carolina, actually, in was February? Yeah, I think so. In February, we went up, up to Fayetteville to do more research and to Bladen County. So this was February 2020. So if you can think in your mind what's going on in the world in <laughs> that time of year, 2020. So this is the former uh, location of Owen Hill Plantation, which was owned by John Owen, who was former governor of North Carolina. And um, in the brick building is where um, his Father Thomas Owen and wife. The wife and then three of the grandchildren who died young are all built are all buried within that, that brick frame that you see. So John Owen owned um, the Owen Hill Plantation, but across the Cape Fair um, with the Milton Plantation, which was inherited by James Owen, the brother who Omar spent um, his whole life with. Um, and the significance of this photo was. Um, at the end of his life, he moved back, him and James Owen moved back to Blaney County to the Owen Hill Plantation. And they died there, and Omar is supposedly buried around uh, this brick structure. So probably right outside the structure. It sounds like he was not buried in the structure, which is pretty full, um, but rather somewhere along the outside. And uh, it's interesting to me that this is the condition of the place where Omar was possibly buried. And also the Owen family, with, which if you are not concerned with Omar's legacy, um, it's amazing that the family of former governor's <laughs> family burial plot is in this condition. There's nothing that marks the spot. Um, it actually took us a little bit of time to find it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I hope somebody will take it upon themselves to clean up the space and, and, and maybe put a marker there or, or do more research into exactly where Omar may be buried. Apparently there was at one point a gravestone um, that was stolen or vandalized. We couldn't find anything there that indicated, you know, that said his name or anything. There are still um, pieces of the headstones from some of the other family members in there. So if you look in there, you can see in the rubble uh, their names. And this was kind of our initial way to kind of like connect with Omar in some way, was visiting um, the Owen Hill Plantation and kind of making the, you know, really connecting with who he might be. <clears throat> and this was taken along uh, the Cape Fear just outside Fayetteville. 
Um, and so initially we we're trying to investigate, you know, how did Omar make his way up from South Carolina to North Carolina, you know, he was just going from, I don't know if you've driven down to Charleston, there's three major rivers, um, you know, there's no, there would have been no road or, you know, and he describes himself as pretty weak and an old man, so imagine him kind of traversing the, the Carolinas and making up here, so we thought, you know, maybe he came up to Cape Fear or, you know, how did he get up here? And the Owens, uh, and you'll see in a later photo, would take the Cape Fear from their plantation mm -hmm. to First Presbyterian. And so the Cape Fear seemed to play a major role in uh, Omar's life in the Carolinas. Someday I hope someone who, who has uh, researched the um, Maritime Underground Railroad will s see if perhaps mm -hmm. there's some connection there to how Omar made his way um, to Fayetteville or to Bladen County anywhere in that area because it seems unlikely if you drive that he would make it across those major rivers in South Carolina very easily so perhaps he in fact came up the coast mm -hmm. in, a, in a, a boat perhaps. And we visited the church um, we looked at the rolls where it taught where Omar's name is still um, on there as, as property of General Owen um, it was interesting just to kind of see the vibe of the place where supposedly he, you know, sat in the aisle. He was trying to envision how would, in, in his day, um, it, an African man be sitting in the middle of the aisle. It just, it, it, I'm not sure if that's one of those fantastical stories that's told about him. Because um, in the day, of course, enslaved people would sit in the balcony and, and you would have white people on the f uh, floor level. How was it that that came to be? It just struck me as... Um, yeah either not true, or did that say something about how Omar was treated a bit as sort of a centerpiece that the Owen mm -hmm. family showed off, mm -hmm. you know? It, it, what is the context of that? We wanted to see the structure itself. And we found in a, a few different church records when they listed, um, you know, the family and who was what, their family and them being a part of the church, they listed them a lot of time as a servant or as an Indian servant or prince is what we saw a lot of times as this kind uh, of this idea that he had to be elevated, yeah. in, in, in other words. And this is First Presbyterian in downtown Fayetteville, and this is where he was baptized in 1820. And this is Adam Baya, who's the imam of the mosque in Fayetteville that is named for Omar, and he's done a lot of work to um, try to preserve his legacy and ensure his memory uh, in that area, including a marker uh, to Omar that uh, as he explained, he worked hard to make sure we didn't reference him as a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and so Adam has done uh, some great work there and done a lot to, uh, to, to help with that, that preservation of a more accurate memory of him. Um, Adam also, interestingly, in his office has a box of material. So we went and spoke with him, and he, he's, a, he's an accountant. He pulls out a box from uh, his office and pops it on the table for us, and it's the papers of Thomas Paramore, the historian who wrote about Omar uh, in the 70s, as I recall. And in this box, it talks about um, Paramore's connection with uh, Senegal. He had been trying, he had arranged to have a Senegalese official send an investigator to a particular village we can talk about later called Barobi. Um, so, so his notes about that uh, conversation are in there. And that was helpful as far as trying to see what could we lend when we went to Senegal that would be more um, useful to scholars and that would be also just more accurate. So we put Barobi on our list of places to go. Um, and there's also some correspondence in there uh, between Paramore and some Owen descendants. So if you're ever interested, he wasn't sure what to do with the papers. Uh, uh, Paramore's wife apparently had given them to him. So anyway, so we went through this box of papers and, and learned a little bit more at least about the Barobi piece and how that came to be. And it was important for us to not only talk to Adam, but you know, to kind of make sure it was part of the story because although we didn't know about Omar, you know, there was obviously an influence that an impact they left in North Carolina. And so this is uh, the Charleston Harbor. Um, and the, I don't know if anyone's ever been to the, the Battery in Charleston, but you can see the kind of antebellum homes and then uh, St. Michael's. And just kind of like showing how Charleston very much looks as it did 
yeah. in Omar's day still with the homes and kind of what he might have first seen when he um, entered the harbor in Charleston. And the wharf, so Omar most likely, given the time period he lays out, was brought in on a slave ship in late 1807 in that time period, uh, which at that time, the, the wharf that slave ships arrived at in Charleston was called Gadsden's Wharf. Um, there have been many wharves all around the peninsula, but at that point in time, slave ships came in through Gadsden's Wharf. And that is where, if you're not familiar with it, a uh, new International African American Museum is being built. Um, mm -hmm. That's going to be really interesting. It's post was supposed to open this year. It's been delayed a bit, um, but it will be at Gaston's Wharf, which, uh, if the timeline is correct, would be where Omar arrived. So when we so it's, so we're journalists, not uh, not scholars, and so we're looking at the story uh, of Omar. And when we got the funding for a trip to Senegal, we we got it through the Pulitzer Center, um, which provide us a very generous grant that enabled us to go. You know, we work for a local newspaper, and funding a trip to Senegal would not be normally within the budget uh, of our travels. So thanks to them, we were able to go. But we were thinking, you know, how do we frame this trip? What, what are we looking for? Um, we know Omar said he was from Food Tutorial, but that's a big place. You know, where, what do we, where do we go? Where, how do we start? And so we decided to um, frame the journey through the idea of, of where Omar wrote what appears to be a place name uh, that he was from or where he was captured and what what is that word and where is that place? Uh, it could tell us a lot of stuff. It could tell us uh, you know, about Omar's uh, family, his people. It could tell us about his, his life and his education. It could tell us what river he most likely was taken from. Was he taken from the Senegal River? Was he taken from the Gambia River? Um, where was that? And if, if we know he was taken from the Senegal River, from San Luis, and we know the time period, we can look at the slave voyages specifically that fit that um, fit those criteria and also mesh with his time period that he lays out for the Middle Passage he was on. So we wanted to see if we could figure out where that place was. So we use that as sort of a guiding, uh, sort of like, like a tension point. If you think as a writer, what's the tension of the story? The tension of that journey would be uh, trying to figure out where this place is, and this is a reference to it in his in the uh, 1819 letter. Um, so that's how we kind of decided we would frame it and give us some way of having any idea where to go. <laughs> and so we were initially planning to go to Senegal in March of 2020, but obviously uh, everyone's lives changed uh, in March of 2020. South Carolina actually had its first case, I think, the week we were supposed to travel, which, you know, we were leaving out of Charleston. It was a pretty normal flight. Um, we get to Atlanta. We're like all excited. We're supposed to go to Atlanta to Charles de Gaulle. Mm -hmm. from, to Charles de Gaulle. So we're like feeling good. We sit down. We're like resting. We took a selfie. Hey, we're going. Yeah. <laughs> we were like all prepped. And then Jennifer starts getting calls from her husband and editor being like, Have you seen the news? Have you seen the news from Trump? And he's like, No, what is it? What is it? He's like, He has banned all travel from Europe, which is like, our, you know, in between stop was Charles de Gaulle, and we're like, we're about an hour from boarding, and we're like, do we go? Do we, do we get and off? If you remember, President Trump did not say except for American citizens. So mm -hmm. he just said he was banning travel from Europe as of a couple of days from that moment. So, what do you do? Yeah. Do you want to do? So yeah, we we're like, <laughs> so we're just calling up our editors and like getting advice. Like, should we go? Like, will we be able to like come back? Like, what's because we had no idea exactly what COVID-19 was at this time, you know, we didn't really, how bad and like, should, if we did have it in Senegal, what do we want to, you know, Where would so we there were a lot of questions, but ultimately we decided to just wait and hope that we'd be able to return, mm -hmm. which ended up working a lot in our benefit and gave us a lot more time to do more research over here and then also plan out our itinerary um, for our, our trip back a lot better. And also, by low connected us with a man named Abdullah Gia there, who was a tremendous help and wound up being just um, an invaluable part of the team we traveled with. So it actually, it really, for many reasons, was a blessing in disguise, but it didn't feel like it at the time yeah. when we were <laughs> flying back to Charleston. <laughs> and so this is um, on Gory Island at one of the House of Slaves. 
And so this is actually at the end of our trip. We were in Senegal for two weeks. Um, we started in Dakar and then went to San Luis, and then we went um, inward um, along the Senegal River to Porto, which is where we was kind of like our base of operations. Um, we kind of stayed there for eight to nine days and would make trips um, further um, into Fujitoro. Um, but the reason we saved kind of Gori for, for last was to kind of see Fujitoro and where Omar came from. And so when we came here, we kind of, because walking around you learn about the horrors of transatlantic like, slave trade and the conditions that they were in before being taken to Charleston or wherever else in the world. And so it kind of really hits you when you realize the amount that uh, Omar would have lost, you know, being taken away, especially the conditions when you hear them describe them in uh, detail. It was so powerful. If you haven't been there, I, it, I found it to be just, you, you think you kind of understand something? I don't know. For me, going there was very, Powerful. And it just reminded Charleston kind of, Charleston's very beautiful, but it also has some really horrible uh, history uh, behind it, like these beautiful red walls, but there's so much more behind them. And Charleston, if you don't know, is where it was the major slave port. It, something like 40% of, of enslaved Africans who were brought to the U.S. came in through the port of Charleston. So, um, so we assembled a team. I mentioned Abdullah. Um, we also worked with Mamram Sek, who is a professor in Dakar. So Mamram is a linguist, and Abdullah um, uh, was extremely helpful in reading Arabic and understanding what Omar might have been writing or the nuances of what he had written. Abdullah also was from Futuro, so the two of them together, Mamram um, speaks excellent English, neither Dad nor I speak French, and so um, it was extremely useful to have Mamram and Abdullah with us for different reasons. And as a team, I felt like we, um, it, was, it was just a great team. So we went to San Luis, and what we decided to do was, as I said, to try to frame our journey by hunting for this word that looks like Kaba, uh, or Kabia, or Kebe, <laughs> different ways people saw it. And we began looking through old maps, trying to see where in the region um, might this be. And uh, as we traveled and we looked at the question also of this land between two rivers that Omar references being from. So, of course, you know, a lot of people thought the land between two rivers referenced the Senegal to the north and the Gambia River to the south, which would encompass basically all, almost all of modern day Senegal, which struck us as a, a really big place for someone like Omar to reference being his home. If I was to describe where I'm from, I wouldn't say I'm between I live between North Carolina and Georgia. But I might describe Charleston as being between two rivers because, in fact, the peninsula is framed by two rivers. It's a much smaller place that references my immediate um, surroundings. And so it struck us as a large place. And so one of the questions we also were looking at was um, an idea that had been brought up previously by scholars that he was referencing the Isle of Morphil. So we were specifically looking for a place that looked like the word Kaba. Kabia, something like that, on these ancient maps. Uh, and so here we are in San Luis. We were looking for also slave ship manifests, anything that would help us here in the US better understand um, how people like Omar um, were brought here, um, conditions, if there were slaves, specific ship records. Um, and there was not a whole lot, but the maps were useful as far as seeing um, potential, just trying to find ideas where to start. This is, uh, sorry, Mon Raman, that's um, uh, a graduate student of his, a French graduate student who also came with us, um, which was nice having also another female uh, along the journey because obviously some areas in Futa are very conservative and so it was nice to not be by myself <laughs> and sometimes. So this is another photo from the library, just mm -hmm. the records trying to go through them. And, uh, and San Luis is amazingly like Charleston. It looks like Charleston, the, the layout of the way the rivers come around, the beach is, it just felt a lot like Charleston, which was very, um, just very interesting. Yes. Um, so this is a, just basically a map we ran in the paper of where we traveled. So that is the Senegal River um, in the, obviously the dark 
area. The white spots are all the different villages where we actually stopped and talked with people and met with the imams and showed them Omar's writing. Um, one of the things we really wanted to do was to bring his writings as close as possible to the place where he was from. So that we could, for one thing, just share them with people who would be interested in studying them and also um, to uh, get their thoughts as to what he was saying because uh, up until then there hadn't been, as far as I knew, uh, a Senegalese translation. You know, I wanted to get his writing translated by someone, and, and even better, someone from Futa because the nuances of what he wrote would be most evident to somebody uh, who learned language the same way he did, who um, wrote the language uh, as he did. So we were trying to accomplish those two things as we went to these different villages. And, and if you look to the north, uh, Hodor is the northernmost white spot, <laughs> the second one in. And then down to the south, um, just for a frame of reference if you've been there, uh, you're looking down there at Chiloin, Gaba Bay, uh, or Fonde, or the, the, I believe the three yeah. spots down there. And so for me, there's, a, um, there's not a lot of detail Omar left about Fututoro or Senegal in his autobiography. Uh, and one big point was I lived between two rivers. And so I think we had an off day one day, and I wanted to kind of like show what exactly is that point. So I asked um, uh, one of our people who was going with us, uh, Yusu Baji, and I was like, yeah, I was like, Hey, do you think we could kind of find where Fututoro starts, like the point in which the Senegal and Due kind of split? And so it kind of like took us what, about two hours to kind of finally get to it. And then when we get to this point, um, we kind of can't take our car any further because then we have to start walking. And but it's about another about thirty minute to forty five minute walk and. I'm trying to get nice light, sunset, and so we're kind of racing against time because it's about to go down, and so, but we don't know where it is, so um, we asked, it's like, these two teenagers, like, we'll show you, it's no problem, so I have my gear, and we're just, like, racing through, um, basically, uh, just this trail to this point, which is just a very serene, very calm point, but it kind of gives people a view of, kind of, the Senegal, and expansiveness of it and kind of just gives more people an idea of what Omar's uh, home would have looked like. And one thing I'll mention for, for if it's useful for people studying Omar is that everywhere we went, there was no debate that what he meant by the land between two rivers would be the Isle of Morphal area. Mm -hmm. That was not, nobody, the idea of that being between the Senegal and Gambia was ridiculous, really. Mm -hmm. So if that's useful, people there definitely in interpreted that as meaning that area. And just a side note, which is not scientific, but just my observation. When we took his writings outside of that area, nobody asked to keep them. Mm -hmm. But when we were on the island, everybody asked to keep them. So mm -hmm. many that I had to go make extra copies. So I don't know what that means, uh, other than people perhaps felt more uh, connected to Omar in that area, but just uh, as an observation, I thought that was interesting. And so this was one of the first stops we made in Dimat Wala, and where we spoke with an imam to get kind of our, uh, our first look at Omar's writing. Um, and so this is another part of kind of showing Omar's life or what it might have been. And this was at a Quranic school um, that they were having, and it was kind of Obviously, you know, there's no relation to Omar, but this is might have been the same way Omar would have first initially learned the Quran and started his schooling and education. And so it's kind of important to show that and give people an idea of Omar's life in a way. And I love this photo. I have this actually in my office now. The 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 um, the idea of of Omar just being like any child, going to school with his friends, laughing. Um, to me, that was really poignant because one thing we wanted to show was like, what is his, what was his life like? Um, what was he taken from? What was this life that he had? He was 37 years old. You know, he had family, a life, uh, you know, everything uh, uh, taken from him. And I, I really, we really wanted to kind of emphasize that idea that, that 
um, to your point earlier, Omar was, you know, we talk about Omar as an enslaved man in America, but that's a, a piece of Omar's life, and that he ha we were really trying to show um, as much as we could today what his life would have been like. And when we went to Dimatwalo is when we, um, so we met with this imam who was uh, very widely respected in the region. Uh, his, his name was Amadou Beatty Sai, probably saying that wrong, I apologize. Um, but we, so we handed him Omar's, the letter, the 1819 letter and his autobiography. And we didn't explain anything about what we were looking for because we didn't want to sort of pollute people's minds or lead them in a direction. We just wanted to know what they saw. And so when he was reading um, uh, the letter first, where Omar says, I wish to return to the land of Africa to a place on the river called, well, and he immediately reads it as Kape. He says, it reads it as Kape, and he says, oh, that's near here, I can, I can help you get there. So all of this wrangling over what this word says, he had no trouble reading it. He just read right, and he didn't have as much trouble as a lot of people have had reading the text. Mm -hmm. So, um, for whatever that matters, he, he read it very cleanly, and, and to him there was no uh, hemming and pawing. His nephew, who was also an elder in the, in the village, uh, was with us and he had him read it, he agreed. So we were like, oh wow, Kape, okay, because the diacritics are not um, helpful and the, um, uh, there's no Kaba, which is obviously people's first uh, reaction to it. There, nobody could think of a place ever called Kaba in this area and we couldn't find any evidence on the old maps, so, uh, so we went to Kaba. Uh, we, we went to a lot of places uh, searching for what this word might be, um, but Kape is how he read it, and um, looking at the contextual clues that Omar gives us, uh, it does match a lot of what he wrote. It's right on the banks of the Senegal River, um, it's high up, it's a village that's like 400 years old, um, so obviously old enough. Uh, the, the elders there described uh, the history of Mauritanians coming over and raiding the village and also Europeans coming up the river mm -hmm. in boats and, and raiding the village. And so, um, and, and there are other clues as well, but it, it fit a lot of what, um, a lot of what Omar described. And Mom Ramsek, the professor who also traveled with us, uh, he and uh, Abdullah went back to Kape this summer and are, are looking more at that village, partly because when we went, you know, we have an entourage. <laughs> it's them, it's these two Americans, and why are these Americans here? What do they want from us? Um, is it where it, I think for them to be able to go back and speak the language and, and um, stay longer um, be really useful to seeing what they find as far as um, evidence if that is or is not uh, Omar's. <laughs> so Barobi, I mentioned Barobi earlier. Um, Professor Paramore uh, had corresponded with um, an investigator, well, a Senegalese official who hired an investigator to go to Barobi, um, and he had surmised that Barobi was Omar's home. So we made a stop there, and we asked the um, imam and, and uh, some descendants of that Omar uh, to tell us a story. And the story that they told about Omar ibn Kebe was nothing like what Omar ibn Said wrote in his autobiography, and it became apparent that they had not read Omar's autobiography. Um, they had uh, read a couple pages from it that a Mauritanian professor had brought down um, several months before we went, um, but they had not read it in the entirety. And so uh, we asked them the story about their Omar, again, before we showed them the autobiography to get um, clarity on that story. There were two local stories uh, that sort of were the tradition of this Omar. Neither of them matched what Omar ibn Said wrote, but also the story that they told had changed from the one that they told um, the investigator back when Paramore was researching it. So, um, so we showed them the, the autobiography, and um, it was interesting to watch. I, th I, I felt as if the man who was reading it as he realized that the story was not anything like the story they told, was trying to kind of move his interpretation toward, toward that story. Um, but in my mind, I'd left 
feeling like this was not mm -hmm. the same Omar. Um, also, the, the, the ancestry that they provided spans only four generations, whereas Omar, the, of the autobiography, would have been born 250 years before or so. Mm -hmm. So how do you take four generations across 250 years as people are having babies at you know, 80, 90 years old? <laughs> that's unlikely. So to me, I left unconvinced yeah. that that was. Um, also, obviously, Barobi looks nothing like the word Omar wrote. So. And this was in Orofonda, one of the stops we made. And we found there's no connection to Omar there, but it was part of our reporting process was, you know, any lead or any time someone's like, oh, I think it might be this, or I think you should go here. We went to go um, check it out, which also gave us, you know, even an even greater view of the area and the communities around there. And this is a mosque there that's 700 years old, mm -hmm. I think, which also kind of, which is important to include, because I think, there's an idea about the enslaved people brought over, um, by, especially by the white owners, like the Owens, that you know Omar was uneducated. You know he had no background or religion or anything. So it was, I think it was important to include this to show the rich history of Senegal and the Equatorial region. It was really interesting too to go meet so many people. You know, everywhere we went, I have to say the hospital, the hospitality was just amazing. People were so warm and inviting uh, to these strangers who show up suddenly, uh, you know, in their um, communities or their homes. And um, this is a photo. This is interesting. This is in Orafundi, which is way inland. That a, that a boy came up to us and was like, "Oh, he was from the U.S. and he spoke English." and um, he was there uh, going to Quranic school, which was just funny to meet somebody from the U.S. and uh, in this place. Is, is he in this? No, no. He was a younger, yeah. younger child. <laughs> but this was just kind of going to show more about the community um, and, and these places we visited and what you know Omar was cut off from when he was mm -hmm. brought to Charleston and then living with the Owens, you know, an environment and community completely opposite from what you know, he grew up and was raised in. And again, we're trying to, as journalists, show our readers what that world was like for him, even though so much time has passed, that if, if there's the, the essence of the place is what we wanted to show. And this is in Kope, actually, uh, one of the banks of the Senegal River, um, and right across is Mauritania. And um, this was kind of, think, midway yeah, or so. in our time. In, in that area, but it just kind of shows just kind of how close it was to Senegal to illustrate, you know, where Omar might have been his last kind of steps, you know, in Senegal might have been, you know, along his banks. It was interesting that the men were building a fishing boat while we were there, which, um, you know, you imagine Omar being taken, he most likely was taken out on a, a fishing boat, according to the, the local people. So you wonder, you know, did it look like this? Was this the spot that he left from? Um, it really did feel very right in a lot of ways, which isn't, um, you know, a, a scholarly um, evidence, but just this, this insane, the idea that even if this wasn't this exact spot, it was a place like this, um, where he and, and so many others were taken. It was really, um, it was really an amazing spot. And there's a lot of dust in the air from the Sahara, and it was particularly bad that day. And so it just makes everything look kind of foggy. Um, and it, I don't know, it just lent sort of a mystical sense to the place. Um, it was really interesting. And directly across the river is Mauritania. And when we looked at some of the old maps, they spelled Kabe, K-O-P-E. And Kabe would sometimes be on the, on the modern day Mauritanian side, and sometimes be on the Senegalese side. So I, we wondered, did the village actually sort of straddle the river? Um, who knows? But it was really, really neat in Kape. We took not only Omar's writing, but we also took the three images that we know of of him. And so we handed it out, you know, copies of them. And it was so interesting when we went to Kape, the whole village came and gathered, and we passed them around. It was really great to see. 
um, people reading his words, you know, like reappropriating his 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 uh, words and thoughts, and looking at the photos of him. Well, were these descendants of his? You know, maybe. Um, and that was just, I don't know, for me, really cool to just watch them look at him, at him pass him around. And um, uh, it was a really special moment. And that, I, I hope we can learn more about if that is the right place or not. Maybe we'll never be able to say for sure. But. Mm -hmm.